interested in taking a deep dive each week into a compliance or compliance-related topic? Then Compliance Into the Weeds is the podcast for you. Join Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, and Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, as they go into the weeds to flesh out a story which you can use to better inform your compliance program. Both you and your compliance program will be the better for listening to this podcast. Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. In this episode, Matt Kelly and Tom Fox take a deep dive into the Deutsche Bank FCPA settlement, focusing on internal controls, red flags that were overlooked, and a policy that was paper in action only. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, back again with Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. Hello, Tom. Good to be here this week. So, Matt, it turns out that uh, serendipity and uh, uh, the um, zeitgeist have joined Compliance Into the Weeds as we both blogged about the same thing this week, which was uh, the Deutsche Bank FCPA settlement. So uh, why don't you just jump into it and set the stage for our listeners? Yeah, sure. So this uh, settlement was announced by the Justice Department and Securities and Exchange Commission late Friday afternoon. While the rest of us were distracted watching the attempted coup, they snuck this in. Uh, Deutsche Bank will wind up paying $130 million in total uh, with the Justice Department that is actually related to two fraud cases that are separate and unrelated. One of them FCPA related. The other one, I think, is some sort of commodities trading scam that, I'll be honest, I did not really look into as part of what I was writing about. But uh, the FCPA case was the other one that the Justice Department had brought charges against uh, and that the SEC also was involved in the FCPA one. Um, the $130 million included an 80, I have the notes here, $87 million criminal penalty. Uh, it was a $43 million penalty of, I think, disgorgement in interest only. To the Securities and Exchange Commission. There was no additional penalty there. Uh, there were some various other penalties here and there, but it all rolls up to $130 million. Um, the facts of the case, Tom, I'm going to be honest, like I, I kind of gloss over them at this point because everybody watching now, um, stop us if you heard this before, third parties, Middle East, poor due diligence, China, I mean, come on, we have heard the, this broad sort of story about FCPA forever now. Um, specifically, I believe it was that Deutsche Bank was using business development consultants. That was their name for fixers and overseas agents and third parties and whatnot, um, where a lot of these agents were simply fronts and conduits for bribery Um I zeroed in, Tom, on one specific to Abu Dhabi, and we could talk about that. But I know that this also was happening in China. I know it was happening in Italy. I know there was um, another case, I think, happening in Saudi Arabia. But uh, same story, different day, different third agents. Um, and we can get into the internal control issues, which is really where I was interested. Um, but that's the broad details, uh, broad brushstrokes of what happened here. But I took a little bit different uh, takeaway from the third parties. And you're right, uh, that's not anything new. But what struck me was just the brazenness of the uh, use of corrupt third parties for a corrupt process. So, for instance, in Abu Dhabi, the uh, a business uh, consultant was a relative of the foreign official. Yep. In uh, Saudi Arabia, they took it to an entirely different level. It was the wife. And um, there, Deutsche Bank actually set, set up a uh, British Virgin Island shell company to pay her so that uh, she would influence her husband to um, uh, continue to do business with Deutsche Bank. There were, for both of those two agents, four managing directors who had actual knowledge and wrote emails about uh, these uh, business development consultants. But above that, above them, there were... Um, there was a committee, Global Risk Committee, that actually reviewed these. And specifically to Abu Dhabi, they discussed the fact that the uh, business consultant was a relative of the foreign official uh, who was going to be investing money with Deutsche Bank. And so we had the committee overseeing 
the managing directors who are part of the oversight process and the internal controls that I think you uh, are going to talk about uh, actually approving this. So the brazenness of the corruption, I don't think can can really be discounted. Um, this corruption occurred uh, while the company was under monitorship. So um, uh, and under another FCPA investigation, uh, if there was ever an entity that was uh, specifically designed to do business with Donald Trump, I really can't think of one who was uh, better suited than Deutsche Bank, given their levels of corruption. The um, the order, or rather the deferred prosecution agreement incorporating the criminal information went into great detail. Uh, and so I appreciated that because... Uh, we still have to be reminded of brazenness, and I th- still think that's a lesson that compliance officers uh, need to to learn and to be aware of. And if you're in that situation, uh, you know, it might be time for you to check out the Radical Compliance Friday blog, uh, which lists the job openings, because you really need to go uh, to uh, another uh, company uh, because you're in, in a world of hurt. But uh, you wrote uh, really well, I, and uh, frankly, uh, it looked like you had way too much fun talking about the internal control failure. So why don't we take a dive into those? Well, Tom, first off, I just wanted to note uh, specifically on the Abu Dhabi one. Uh, yes, it is true that the business consultant hired was a relative of the state owned official. But do not forget that the business consultant had another brother who was going to be part of the project, but not on the, the third party contract. And that brother was the business partner of the state-owned uh, state official uh, in some sort of a side enterprise. So I guess this is a uh, double whammy of relatives related to the state-owned uh, enterprise and the government official. And I love this detail. Help me out on this, um, that the state-owned official was all, the state official was also asking Deutsche Bank to help him finance a mega yacht. Now, I, I have to admit, I didn't know that there was a difference between a yacht and a mega yacht I cannot recall if the mega yacht was ultimately then also financed by Abu Dhabi or by Deutsche Bank, um, although they did pay the business consultant $3.5 million um, for generic advice and introductions, as the statement of fact said. And uh, shortly after paying him $3.5 million, they did win the deal from Abu Dhabi and its sovereign wealth fund. Like I said, I don't know whatever happened with the mega yacht, but I just thought that was a great detail. Um, you know, I, I I have to tell you that the radical compliance yacht is not a mega yacht. No, it is not. It is more like a dinghy that occasionally my kids play with in the bathtub, and that's probably about the size of my, my boating experience. Um, so the anti-corruption policies and the internal control failures, and I, I took a deep dive specifically into the SEC complaints uh, to get all of this, but... What really intrigued me was that on paper, Deutsche Bank had all the right policies. They were actually, I thought, they sounded pretty reasonable and comprehensive. So as far back as 2009 and 2008, which would be the whole length of the misconduct in question that happened from 2009 into 2016, uh, they had an anti-bribery policy that specifically said uh, it defined bribes very expansively, anything of value. Um, It included a clause that said using business development consultants to obtain business information confidentially and improperly, like that was forbidden. Um, The bribery policy required pre-contract due diligence, um, documentation of the services rendered, payments being in proportion to the services that were supposed to be rendered, like all the stuff that you would see in the FCPA resource guide from the Justice Department about dealing with third parties. That's all in Deutsche Bank's anti-bribery policy. Okay, looked great. Then they had a policy on using business development consultants, um, and they were talking about how the due diligence should determine whether the consultant was related to a foreign government official. Uh, That person, if the answer was yes, that person would be flagged as a PEP, and then there would be extra approvals and discussion and all this stuff. So again, we have a good-looking anti-bribery policy. We have a good-looking consulting policy policy. They clearly are designed in a cohesive way to support each other. Great looking on paper. Didn't happen at all. And that's really what intrigued me. It's like, where is the breakdown? Because I think a lot of people listening to us today can appreciate that challenge. You have a good looking paper based compliance program. How do you then make it actually work? Or what could make that paper not work? Um, 
So what went wrong with Deutsche Bank, I, in my opinion, is that for as much as the policies and procedures looked good on paper, the business managers in the first line of defense were the ones who were actually in charge of implementing all of these compliance procedures, which means they could choose to implement them poorly or not at all. And it seems like that is what they did. Um, but there's a, a paragraph from the SEC order that I think is very relevant. Let me just read some portions of it. Um, in practice, the implementation and oversight of the policy fell to the consultant's business sponsor. Business sponsors were responsible for generating business for Deutsche Bank and were compensated in part based on the revenue earned by Deutsche Bank. So, and we could go on from there. The, that paragraph in the consent order, it, uh, it has a few more details, but it really seems to me that what went wrong is that the people who would have to abide by the compliance policies were also the ones who had responsibility for implementing and following through on the compliance policies. Um, and like I said, that means they would have the power to not follow through or to ignore them, which very much seems to be the case in numerous uh, instances outlined in these complaints. Um, and it really drove home the lesson to me about how an, em an empowered compliance function is part of the success of the compliance program. Um, so often we talk about a compliance program that is properly designed for effective internal controls. And what does that actually mean? Well, part of it means an effective design is an empowered, independent compliance function separate from the business units that can push the business units. No, we are not gonna use this consultant. We're not gonna do this. This invoice is incomplete. If you don't have that independent compliance function that can do those things, that is not a properly designed compliance function. You have a design flaw, and the design flaw is poor independence. That, that's really where I went with uh, my analysis of what was going wrong at Deutsche Bank. So, Matt, the, um, could it, uh, in addition to having the front line implement the policy, I guess the, uh, the other thing that struck me is – this was even several paces past uh, the Goldman Sachs case, where there the compliance function did appropriately raise red flags, certainly around J. Lo's involvement, mm -hmm. but they were eviscerated by the frontline managing director and the uh, Global Risk Management Committee, their, their equivalent of that. But here, we didn't even seem to see compliance anywhere. And... Uh, they spoke about some due diligence, but the due diligence only raised red flags. And then uh, I thought the most damning was the role of internal audit, who appropriately identified, and I believe in 2010 and 2011, uh, uh, potential corruption red flags. And those were completely swept under the rug, if I recall correctly. Yeah, so that is an excellent point about internal audits role here is they conducted two audits in 2009 and 2011. Um, and the first audit in 2009 flagged a lot of what you and I have just been discussing here, where they even recommended centralized oversight of due diligence and documentation and um, other smaller steps like all consultant contracts should include a right to audit clause. Um, so they compiled the report. It went right up to senior management at Deutsche Bank. And then, as the SEC order says, only limited steps were taken in response to that plan. Uh, and then they did the whole thing all over again in 2011, another internal audit, flagging the same stuff, going up to the same management level, senior level people, and only limited steps were taken in response. Um, so clearly, there's a, a lot of management I, I don't know what the word is, ignorance or deliberate blindness, willful blindness to these problems that uh, internal audit had flagged. But internal audit was basically flagging that compliance had no real authority and autonomy to implement internal controls and to uh, run the compliance program. Uh, you know, there was one interesting point, a detail in the Abu Dhabi case that interested me. So they knew that the consultant uh, had multiple relatives who were all involved in this state-owned enterprise and the minister who ran it, and they're all buddy-buddy, and that this stank, um, and they were asking for the funding for the mega yacht. 
And that consulting engagement went all the way up to the Global Management Review Committee. I think for the Middle East, there were several managing directors involved in that committee. And there was a compliance executive involved in that discussion. But I don't know what was the vote there? What was the outcome? I mean, we do know the outcome. They hired the consultant. So clearly that was the outcome. But did con- compliance roll over and just say whatever? Um, did compliance get outvoted, which could very well be possible? Uh, we don't have that level of detail. But you are correct that management was aware. Internal audit and compliance were bringing concerns to senior management about specific consultants and about more systemic weaknesses in the compliance oversight of their third parties. They had red flags all over the place. And what then happened? Not much. Uh, Up until the investigation finally started rolling in 2016. Uh, Worth noting that uh, Deutsche Bank did not get any credit because it had not voluntarily self-disclosed that misconduct. Um, It then did get cooperation credit from the Justice Department, um, and we can talk about some of the other wrap up details there. But uh, you're right, Tom, like this, this was a big mess. And a lot of people seem to know about it. And they just let it continue to be a mess. So uh, I think we were actually a step beyond conscious indifference, because uh, with regarding both the Abu Dhabi business consultant and the Saudi Arabian business consultant, there was actual knowledge by bank officers who were a part of the email trail cited in the criminal information. Um so that was sort of uh, one fact. The, uh, the other thing um, was, you're absolutely right, this, it's, it's not clear how this information came to the Department of Justice or SEC. Was it, was it uncovered by the monitor? Uh, was it uh, some other uh, mechanism? But um, the, the bank is still under a monitorship. And the 25% credit, we've now seen that on several uh, pretty bad cases through the fall of 2021 and now this case. And I've, I've really come around to believe that if you uh, cooperate and remediate extensively after you're caught, you're going to be eligible for some credit. The language in the FCPA corporate enforcement policy uh, talked about uh, extraordinary circumstances, uh, but now we've seen in three or four circumstances and enforcement actions credit being given. So the the 50% credit for self-disclosure, 25% credit for cooperation, and 25% credit for remediation seem to stand uh, independently. And I think that's an important thing for compliance practitioners or perhaps white-collar defense lawyers to understand they don't seem to be interlinked. So you can be an extraordinarily bad actor, as Deutsche Bank it was and apparently still is, mm-hmm. and still receive uh, some credit. Uh, The other thing was, um, we're going to bring in another tech tool here. This is so cool. Because Matt texted me this weekend and said that Deutsche Bank DPA requires full cooperation in any investigation by any domestic law enforcement or regulatory agency. Now, that's boilerplate language in every FCPA DPA DPA period. But you thought it was particularly significant in this case, Matt. Why? Uh, Because we should remember that Deutsche Bank is the banker for one Donald J. Trump and the Trump organization. We know for a fact that the New York attorney general is looking at Donald Trump and the New York state attorney general has already specifically said on Twitter, I look forward to seeing you after January 20th. Uh, We know that in that uh, case against Donald Trump's former personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, he was uh, indicted and sentenced on campaign finance fraud. Uh, He did that at the behest of Individual One, who is Donald J. Trump. So when the Individual One administration comes to an end next week, uh, there is yet another case where where did the money come from for paying off Stormy Daniels? And there's only one bank that was working with Donald Trump where supposedly he would have ordered that hundred and thirty thousand dollar payment. Um, We have the district attorney of New York who is also looking at Donald Trump, and he is the one who is fighting to get the tax returns for Donald Trump. Um, And I believe Deutsche Bank has already said they have provided financial documents to, I think it's Cyrus Vance, the Manhattan district attorney. I might be wrong. Maybe they provided them to either the New York state attorney general or any number of other investigators who are chasing Donald Trump right now. Um, But Deutsche Bank is required 
to cooperate with any future investigations by any state or federal regulator. Um, Geez, who could they be looking at? What sort of Donald um, Deutsche Bank client would be especially interesting? Deutsche Bank also represented Jeffrey Epstein, the convicted sex trafficker who died under mysterious circumstances in federal custody, like CD stuff all the way down. And I keep on wondering, how is this going to factor into whatever might come against uh, the president after he leaves office? Man, I'd like to speculate perhaps in a little bit different direction because I have struggled with why does this bank, why is it still allowed to exist? Um, <laughs> that's, that's a fair question to ask at this point. And the question I would like to pose that to is the head of the New York State Department of Financial Services. Yep. Thank you. Because, I heard about them. Uh, yet another regulator who I think would love to talk more with Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank, uh, I would assume, uh, in the United States, is their banking headquarters is in New York State and city of New York. And why haven't we seen the DFS uh, come in and say, you know, we're going to give you one of those uh, 48-hour show cause orders, show why we should uh, yank your charter now uh, to do business in the state of New York and thereby the rest of the United States? I would say that probably gets much easier for DFS to give that sort of a demand after Deutsche Bank's number one client is no longer the president of the United States. That's speculation on my part, but clearly anything that any regulator here does against Deutsche Bank that might be within spitting distance of Donald Trump's bank records and tax returns, he's going to raise holy hell about it. We already have seen that. Um, it gets much easier to ignore his raising holy hell once he is not the president. Um, so we shall see what might come next. Um, but I suspect Deutsche Bank, like several other overseas banks, they're just big enough that they can't ignore the U.S. market, but they're in New York. And, you know, you need that like you need a hole in the head if you're a foreign bank because you're highly regulated, but you're not that big of a deal in the U.S. market, but you can't not be in it. They, HSBC is another one. You know, they're kind of trapped. They can't ignore the U.S. market, but I don't think they actually want to be here because they get themselves crosswise at regulators so often. And this is yet another case. And then the other thing I was thinking about, Matt, we saw uh, a much more aggressive uh, Federal Reserve and OCC in 2020. And perhaps that started with Wells Fargo or or some other cases. But um, in uh, researching those enforcement actions, uh, particularly Goldman Sachs, it seems that those regulators might uh, also start looking at financial institutions in a different light as well. I think that is definitely possible. Um, That was happening even under the acting OCC director, uh, whose first name escapes me. His last name is Brooks. And he had been nominated just last month to see if he could serve another five-year term as the full-time director for OCC. That was Donald Trump, yet again, trying to sneak in another Trump person and stick the Biden administration with them. That didn't happen. And now the Senate is not going to take up that nomination. So Biden will get to put his own OCC director in there. Um, I think that OCC will start paying much more attention or pressuring banks more forcefully, especially the larger banks, to do a better job with risk management generally. Um, They did that. They hammered Citibank with that. Um, They also did that, I think, against J.P. Morgan or Morgan Stanley, one of the Morgan banks. I can't remember which one, but they have now done this with multiple banks. Worth noting, I don't know how much Deutsche Bank would be on their radar screen because Deutsche Bank doesn't have very many retail operations in the United States. It's not like you can go to a Deutsche Bank ATM where um, OCC would be on that, like all over the place. Um, But I think OCC is going to be pressuring banks to do better with risk management and risk reporting especially so financial regulators will have a better sense of what all the banks are saying about risk so they can have a better sense of all the systemic risk that they have to be worried about. Um, Thanks to COVID, our financial system, our monetary system is kind of running at full tilt. I think there are a lot of concerns among banking regulators about was this ever going to get out of control? I don't think we would have another financial crisis like 2008, but they're worried we could have a financial crisis like 2021 where we don't know what that would look like. So they want better risk reporting. And I think OCC is 
going to lead the charge on that. Um, they were leading the charge already, and under a Biden administration, the, they're only going to be more aggressive. Um, both Matt and I, uh, Matt blogged about this uh, today. I'm blogging about it probably for the rest of the week. We're going to link to those blogs in our show notes. So, Matt, uh, this has been a, a fascinating discussion of a truly fascinating case. Can't wait to see what next week brings us. All right, Tom. Take care. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance in the Weeds. If you have any questions, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. You can email Matt at mkelly at radicalcompliance.com. Also, check out the show notes where I have additional resources available in forms of blog posts written by Matt or myself. I hope you'll join Matt and I again next week where we take another deep dive, literally going into the compliance weeds. Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. We look forward to visiting with you again.